Hey, thanks so much for tuning in to Grace Bible Church Online. Our prayer is that our time in the Word together today continues to encourage and enrich your personal walk with Jesus Christ. While we're so honored that you chose to join us, we just wanted to take a moment to encourage you that this sermon video is merely a resource, one that is designed to make a deposit into your growing relationship with Jesus Christ, but is definitely not a worthy substitute of God's perfect design of you being connected to a local church where the gospel of Jesus is being preached and the word of God is being proclaimed. We believe that it's so important for every follower of Jesus to be connected to a live and in-person biblical community where the Lord can use you and your gifts to serve others while he uses the gifts that he expresses through others to serve you as well. While you are here, please take a moment and click the subscribe and like buttons and leave us a comment below. God bless you on your journey to grow in him and welcome to Grace Bible Church. Hey, that is awesome, isn't it? Y'all have heard a lot about, you can give it up for that. That's, that's um, if you didn't know, um, we partner with an organization called YFC, um, and we're going to tell you a little bit more about that in just a moment, but we just want to share, if you've heard the story of the Teen Center and what is going on there, uh, as Dustin's talked about previously over the last really couple, over months and year, oh, it's been a year now? How long has it been? Years. It's been years. I forget how long I've been here. Come on, what's, this is how it be sometimes. Um, so we want to take a moment. We want to introduce you to someone who's going to come up here and join me in just a moment. This is Tyna Taylor. She's the executive director for Youth for Christ. You can come on up here. Um, I'm still working on learning to be a better MC. you know what I'm saying? So um, you can come on up here. Um, we are really excited to just talk about this ministry for a moment because before we ask her some awesome questions where she has some great information for you, um, our youth group partners heavily with YFC. Um, they are the vehicle that we are able to use to be on school campuses three, four times a week. That's just us locally in Sebring. Um, and they're all over campuses all over the place, um, over Highlands County, like almost every school, maybe. I don't know. Are we close to every school? If not, it's about every school. Uh, so let's take a moment, and I want to, um, I'd ask you a couple questions. I mean, so what is really, what is the mission of YFC, and like what is some of the things you guys do and take part of regularly? Uh, yes, good morning, GBC family. Uh, so the mission of Youth for Christ, it's, we have a very long mission statement, so I'm just going to uh, summarize it. But basically, Youth for Christ reaches um, 11 to 19-year-olds, so middle and high school students in Highlands County, um, with the gospel. And so we go after the kids that are not coming into the local churches. And so our hope is to introduce them into a relationship with Jesus Christ and then plug them into the local churches. 
Yeah, and that's so awesome because, again, you guys are a, what we call a parachurch, which means that you're not a church, but you work with the church, right? Like, you're not we, trying to have church services. <laughs> no, um, we are part of the church. The church, the yeah, capital, capital C, C church. church. I love it. And so what are some ways that people can partner with YFC? Uh, so there are many ways to partner with YFC. Um, Youth for Christ has been in Highlands County for almost 23 years. So June will be 23 years. Um, and over 23 years, we have had prayer partners. So that's very important to Youth for Christ is prayer. Uh, we also have um, volunteering opportunity. So in order to be the hands and feet of Jesus um, to these teens, we need lots and lots of people who will love on just messy teens. <laughs> um, and then financial support as well. Yes, um, and you guys have um, you guys have some big events coming up over here pretty soon this month. Um, can you tell us a little bit about those and how can people get involved with that as well? Yes, so I will be outside afterwards, um, and we have our upcoming banquets. Uh, this is our annual fundraiser. This is how we are able to be sustained and do what we do in our local schools and communities, as well as the teen center. Yep. Um, and uh, so just come see me at the table, and I'll tell you more information. Those are coming up here in the next less than two weeks, um, but we have paid spots that are available, so you don't have to pay nice dinner. You'll get to hear more about it, so come see me afterwards. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, and so you heard it correctly. There's some paid spots that are already taken care of, um, and we want to invite you to be a part of that, so please come see you at the table. Uh, that's a meal, but also so you can really catch a glimpse of what YFC does in a mission of YFC, because I'm telling you, youth ministry is a lot easier working with, a, with people like y, from YFC and working with Tyne as well, who's able to help us get on campus, love students well, but also equip us. We went to a training uh, every year. We're invited to their YFC training where they invite all their volunteers to a, a day-long training where they feed us, which is awesome. Um, and they also equip us with how to love and lead teenagers better, uh, which is such a cool thing that you guys do, and we appreciate that as the local church and the local body. So, um, Yes. Yeah. Let's talk about that for a second. So the teen center, tell us a little bit more about like what that looks like and what's going on within the teen center um, currently. There's stuff that Dustin does get there sometimes, but he's not there weekly. He's not there in the trench with things. What, what's going on there? What's that look like? Yes. So um, as you saw in the video, um, just gave you some brief pictures of from the ground up. Uh, so we had flooring put in, we had air conditioned units put in, basketball hoops put in. Um, there have been lots of food provided. And so lots happen, lot, a lot happens in the kitchen. The kids love to cook. That is a ministry. There's amazing relationship uh, building time happening there, and uh, we've had our first salvation through the Teen Center, which is just a praise report awesome. right there. That's awesome. Um, and so just real quick, the Teen Center um, has been now, this is our second school year. We have seen over 100 students wow. come through that Teen Center from the inner city um, and surrounding Sebring area. And uh, if you come on a Friday night, you're going to see about 40 or 50 teenagers hanging out with leaders um, at that Teen Center. Um, and our community raised the support, yeah. our church was part of that, so yeah. thank you so much for making that happen. There's a beautiful ministry happening in that teen center, so thank you so much. Yeah, we are, yeah, you can give it up for that. That's awesome. Yeah, Tyna, um, Tyna really is, um, and I'm excited that I got to do this moment with her because, like, she really is one of the most dynamic leaders that I have ever met, and she truly has such a heart and passion for students. I mean, not just was she part of the youth group here with Chris, but also, um, like, she's had multiple kids in and out of her home that were not biologically hers that she's helped raise and call her mom, and uh, I just want to let you know that this is a woman who just loves students and loves leading them, um, and she makes Highlands County and YFC better, so thank you for your leadership. Um, it's really a pleasure to work with you as well. So um, let's pray for Tina. So if you want to just extend a handout, we want to pray for the organization as YFC. And I seriously encourage you, um, if you need more information or want to know how can you get plugged in, uh, we would love to come see her out there. She has a booth out there. Um, even if that's simple as serving, I say simple, but even as serving, giving up some time, is preparing food, preparing meals, um, and partnering in all kinds of ways. Trust me, there are plenty of ways you can partner. Um, and no age cap, okay? There's no age cap, no loopholes here. Let's pray. 
Father God, we love you so much. We thank you for YFC that you've placed in this county, God, to be um, just such a great organization that is reaching young people for uh, Christ. Um, and thank you for tying in her leadership and her constant willingness to just uh, lay down her own time and effort just to um, bring people closer to you and bring students closer to you to reach way outside of the boat, God. Reaching the students who are um, may seem at times as a lost cause to most, God, but not for YFC. They are going above and beyond to reach those who may not want to be, may not seem to want to be reached, God. God, uh, but they're taking them, meeting them where they are, teaching them life skills, um, helping them with homework, um, and helping them get their lives on track. God, what a beautiful testimony it is to see people and students giving their lives to Christ through YFC. Uh, thank you for the partnership. Uh, we thank you for being a good God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank, thank you, Tina. You. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. As you can tell, uh, my name is Etienne Doucette. I'm the student life pastor. I, pastor. I'm the pastor. Um, student life pastor here. Um, I am not Dustin Woods. He's away. Um, this is his fifth year anniversary this weekend. Pretty crazy, right? Yeah. Some of y'all have been around longer than Dustin. You're like, man, he was a pup. Yeah, fifth year anniversary. Um, what a basic guy to get married on Valentine's Day, okay? I don't know if he's smart or basic. I don't know which one it is, okay? You only got to remember one date, all right? Um, played myself, I guess. All right. So um, we're really excited, but we're gl I'm glad that we're here because today we're going to talk about, we're going to dive into Mark, uh, right back into Mark 1, 17. Um, that is just the anchor verse. And um, today we're going to talk about, yeah, last week we heard Dustin talk about um, follow me, follow me, right? And as Dustin was talking about follow me, he was mentioning about this cost that it takes to follow Jesus, right? There's a great cost when it comes to following Jesus. And now it's a cost that you know, we are willing to pay. Why? Because we know that it is absolutely worth it. Um, but it's not something that comes lightly. But the good news today is I'm going to encourage you to let you know that not only does he say follow me, but he says, I will make you. Now, that's a promise from Jesus himself to say that if you follow me. Oh, man, what was that? <laughs> what? <laughs> Whew, growing up. All right. If you follow me, I will make you. It's a promise from Jesus that he is much more committed to making you more like him than you are trying to imitate him. That he is far more committed to making you. So before we get started here, we're really excited about that. And we're going to talk about a biblical example. We're going to jump through some snapshots of Peter's life. Um, why? Because I feel like Peter is like the ultimate example of you and I. Um, because, like, he has these great moments of faith, and he does these great, amazing things. And then he has these great moments where you're like, didn't you just say you would die for this man, and now you're telling me you don't know him? Like, that's a little confusing, okay? So Peter's a great example of that. So Mark 1, 17, let's read, let's read that first just to kick this off. If you don't have your Bible, that's okay. Uh, we want to let you know that we do have Bibles that we would love to give to you as a free gift. You can have it. It's free. If you need that, you can go see any of our people in our serve shirts or any of our security team. Um, if you just raise your hand, they would love to get you on or just walk out into the lobby. They'll give you a Bible. We don't want you to leave here without one. Um, but if you don't have yours on you, you forgot it or you got your phone, that's cool too. But we also keep the great big Bible in the sky, we call it, as I call it. Um, and uh, you can read it up there and follow along with us. So Mark 1, 17 reads as such. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of Men. So today we're going to focus on that I will make you. Because in reality, my whole life I've been taught this, that if I want to get anywhere and I want to achieve anything, then I need to what? Work harder, stay up later, go up, get, to, get up earlier, right? Like I need to do all these things. Like we love self-help. Trust me, I got happy on Facebook, all right? So we love self-help, right? We love to share the five-minute abs or the quick-to-lose weight or we love to share the ten keys to success or we love self-help because really we're looking for the fast track and easy way to be better. No one wakes up and says, you know what, maybe they do. I, I, I'm okay with just being okay. Average is good for me. Mediocrity is cool. Like I really enjoy that. And what you realize is the call to follow Jesus, when he says follow me, he invites you into this process where he says, I will make you. Now, a lot of times I think we read God's word and think that was a promise to people long ago. That was a promise to someone far off. But oh, 21st century Christian, 
this is a promise from Jesus to you today. Meaning that I'm going to relieve some pressure off you, okay? Dustin dumped it all on you last week. All right, he told you, like, the cost to follow is great and all that fun stuff. I'm going to relieve the pressure and tell you it's okay because you are not good enough to meet the standard. But Jesus in you is. And because of that, you get to simply walk in that identity. My new identity, right? Because we say it's not about behaving better. It's about believing better. We have to believe the truth that Jesus is who he says he is and he's doing what he's going to do in us. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So let's look at some snapshots of a guy named Peter, all right? Again, one of my favorite characters in the Bible. Why? Because I'm more like him than anyone else in the world, I swear, because he just, whew, crazy. Um, he's got like a roller coaster. So we're going to go through three separate snapshots. The first one, I'm not going to read the story. I'm going to paraphrase for you. The next two, I will read for you, um, just because uh, this story, many of you may know, maybe you don't, um, and we're going to talk through this. And it, it is actually found in Matthew 14, 22 through 33, if you want to write that down, um, just so you can believe me. Um, if, you know, I'm not lying to you up here, read your Bible, you know what I'm saying? Um, but I'm going to tell you the story because I want to paraphrase it for you. So this is a moment in Peter's life where he is being made by Jesus, right? He's walking in the flesh with Jesus, which is pretty cool and pretty awesome. You would figure somebody walking around with Jesus wouldn't struggle at all to be like him, okay? Because he could literally go, oh, I'm supposed to do that, right? Like he can literally look and see him in the flesh. But let me remind you of something what, what Peter goes through even in this moment. So there's this storm going on and they're on the boat. In fact, Jesus walks up to the disciples and he says, hey, you guys, this is after he feeds the 5,000, which we actually believe could be like 20,000 because it only says 5,000 men. Say so they all had families, a lot of people, right? They've seen this miracle. Jesus says, I'm going to go off to pray. Disciples, y'all hop up in a boat and go across, right? Cross, across the sea. Y'all got this. You'll be good. Get in the boat. Take off in front of me. I'll catch up to you later, all right? Don't know how they expected him to catch up, but apparently he was going to catch up by jet ski or something. I don't know. So he's, Jesus says, I'll catch up to you guys. So they start to row off, and all of a sudden, this storm rages up, like hurricane forced winds and all this stuff. Like, like in Florida, we know what that's like, okay? We've experienced hurricanes. If you've been here over 10 years, if you've been here over 15 years especially, you know how devastating and scary hurricanes can be. And some of us, like me, we need AC in our lives. So when you don't have power for five days, you feel like your life is ending, okay? So, like, it's terrible. But you realize, as they go out into the storm, and the waves and wind, and everything's getting real crazy, everything's really hectic, um, and all of a sudden, they see this figure far off. Disciples in a boat are like, dude, we're all going to die. This is crazy. They're screaming. Like, you heard my, verse, my voice crack a second ago? They were all screaming that high, right? Like, super high pitch. All right. They were all screaming, scared for their lives. And as they were in this boat, all of a sudden, a figure starts to appear. And their first reaction, which I argue is completely reasonable, they say, it's a ghost. And they think they see a ghost. And that's me. That's why I told you. I don't play with the dark. Keep lights on because you Ghosts can't be seen in the light, you know what I'm saying? All right, so they saw the ghost. They thought it was a ghost. They see the rain and the winds and everything's getting real crazy around them, and they don't know what to do. And then all of a sudden, this figure comes closer, and like Jesus is like, yo, it's me, Jesus, what's up? And it's like, okay. And Peter's response is so great, because don't hear this wrong. Peter starts off with a great act of faithfulness, because if I see Jesus walking on the water and he's like walking to my boat that's getting really crazy, like rock the boat, don't tip the boat over, baby. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, if he starts walking closer to me, like, my reaction is going to be like, well, cool, Jesus, if that's you, can you just stop this? Because this is really not that fun, okay? I'm not enjoying this. And as he starts to walk towards him, you realize something in that moment that Peter's great faith is he says, Jesus, if that's you, let me walk on water. What? I'm like, I'm cool with just living like, Jesus very well could have just been like, yeah, sure, whatever. He steps down, just sinks. Like, you know what I mean? I'm like, okay, whatever. But he, Jesus says, his, his response is, come. If you want to walk on water, come. And so Peter walks on water. He steps out of the boat, and he starts to walk on water. Like, and he's walking to G closer and closer to Jesus. And as the wind and waves, they, hey, the wind and waves are still going crazy. So I don't know how this works. I don't know if Peter's, like, bobbling up and down or whatever. Like, it's getting wild. Like, but he's walking on water, and he's walking closer to his Savior. And when he sees the face of his Savior, he starts to get closer and closer and closer to immediately he realizes something. Wait a minute. People don't walk on water. And he started to look around, and he started to feel the wind. He started to feel the rain, and he started to feel the waves. And he said, wait. And he took his eyes off of Jesus, right? He takes his eyes off of Jesus, and it says, immediately he began to sink. And as he's on his way down, 
He yells, Lord, save me. And then Jesus says, good luck next time, buddy. No, he immediately reaches out his hand and he pulls Peter up. What does that tell me about Peter and Jesus? It tells me that Peter was within arm's length of Jesus. It tells me that the closer he got to Jesus, no matter how close he was physically, he still took a moment to get distracted by the waves and winds around him. And Jesus saves him, walks him back to the boat. I mean, I imagine he puts his arm around him and just walks him back to the boat, which is still pretty crazy. Maybe he carried him, I don't know. But he walks with him back to the boat. And in this moment, I realize something about Peter. What started off as great faithfulness, due to some circumstances, became great doubt. I don't think Peter said, like, I don't think Peter was just like, hey, Jesus, can I walk on water? That'd be cool. He was probably like, hey, if that's really you, let me walk on water then. Like, what if it really was a ghost? You know what I'm saying? Like, no, but like, it really was Jesus. Like, if that's really you, let me walk on water. And he was eager and jumped out of the boat with great faithfulness that immediately turned to one of the great moments of doubt. And he felt shame. And he felt embarrassed. But when Jesus wraps his arm around Peter, he says, oh, you have little faith. Like, it didn't say that he smacked him in the back of the head and said, what the heck's wrong with you? He didn't say, hey, get, get your stuff together. Come on, why are you, why did you doubt me? How dare you? It's almost as if Jesus knew it was going to happen. It's almost as if Jesus knew that Peter, even out of his great moment of faith, was going to even fall to a plate of, of doubt. And yet, he still invited him to walk on the water. Much like you and I, a lot of times, I think we walk through life and we walk with this great faith and this great gusto, uh, but something around us changes and our image and our view of God becomes distorted. Whether he becomes the reason why it happened and we begin to blame and become angry, or whether we feel like he doesn't care for me, he's not near me, because if he was near, he wouldn't do this. And I always turn back to Hebrews that tells me he'll never leave me nor forsake me, because I have to believe that Jesus is more committed to making me than I am trying to be like him. So let's talk a couple other snapshots of Peter. We're going to read through this one, Luke, two, uh, Luke 22. You can turn your Bible there, verse 54 through 62, as well as it'll be on the, um, it'll be on the screen up above. Luke 22, 54 through 62. Many of you may know this story. Many of you have heard this before. And I want to read through this, and I want to set this up for you a little bit. Uh, uh, after we read, I'll talk a little bit about it. Um, because this story kind of blows my mind, because this is like the most sporadic, like, series of events, I think, in the Bible. It's pretty crazy, in my opinion. Um, it's just kind of like quickly hot and cold, hot and cold kind of stuff. Uh, it, but again, once again, I love that Peter is this example of, like, what it means to be the modern-day Christian. Go. Oh, verse 54, here we go. Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. He's like incognito, kind of hiding out here. Um, then a servant girl, seeing him, had sat at the light and looking closely at him, said, The man also was with him. This man right here. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, you're also one of them. But Peter said, man, I am not. You got the wrong dude. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. Verse 60. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord who had said to him before, the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went, he went out and wept bitterly. So imagine this. What you don't know before this whole conversation is, right, this is as Jesus' journey to the cross, right? And he, this is after the Last Supper, and some things are going on. They're preparing. They're preparing for Jesus to be arrested. He knows it's coming, obviously. He knows the time. He knows what's about to happen. And literally, he walks up to Peter, and Peter's talking to him. And this is how the exchange goes before this moment. He says, hey, Peter, I just want to let you know, like nonchalantly, I guess, whatever, before, before the rooster crows, You'll deny me three times. 
And Peter's defense is like, no, 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 not me. I would never do that. Are you kidding me? I'll die for you. I'll die with you. If you're being crucified, I'm being crucified. If you're there, I'm there. If you're fighting, I'm fighting. I'm there with you everywhere you go. And almost as if Jesus is just like, I know that that's what you want to do. And I know that's what you want to believe. But before this all ends, you will deny me three times. Almost as if like Jesus was giving Peter this like spoiler alert, right? Like don't follow Patrick on Facebook. He spoils movies. Fun fact for you. Um, but like he almost gave this spoiler alert. Like here's the ending. Here's what's going to happen. Here's what you prepare yourself for. And here's the deal. I believe that Peter meant what he said. But a lot of times we like to try to muster up our own strength, muster up our own will power to do things. And we forget to surrender to the God who says, no, 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 it's not you, but it's I, because I will make you. It doesn't say you and I will make you. It doesn't say we are going to work together to make you better. It doesn't say, it says I will make you so Jesus goes and tells, before he goes and denies them, like, this is a crazy series of events. So as they come to arrest him, right, Jesus, or like Peter gets crazy, pulls out a sword, hacks off a dude's ear. Clearly has really bad aim, guys. Spoiler alert, he was not trying to go for the ear. Okay, really bad aim. He's a fisherman, not a, you know, whatever. Like, he, he wasn't going for the ear. But when he was going, he was like, I'm going to fight. And the whole crazy interaction happens where Jesus puts the guy's ear back and says, those who live by the sword will surely die by the sword. And Peter really was like gung-ho, ready to go and fight for Jesus. They arrest Jesus, and as he's going, you see Peter begin to deny Jesus. And I think the, the realness of this situation is realizing that a lot of times I'm more like Peter than I realize. Now, I may very not openly be denying Jesus, but how many times in my own life do I stress and worry and have great angst and go to other people looking to solve my problems because I don't trust Jesus? I'm denying the promises of Jesus, that he is the true and better. I'm denying the very power of the Holy Spirit who dwells within me that says, hey, you may not be able to make it through this circumstance alone, but I will make you prepared and ready and I will sustain you and I will carry you through this it's because he instantly became once again afraid of the circumstances they became too great and his faith became too little in the moment when things are good and everything is wonderful it's so easy to put our trust and faith in god like when your business is thriving your marriage is thriving your kids are all behaving and going to school and got good grades and they're doing well and it's easy to hold on to that and our identities become so wrapped up in this performance based life and we have to remember something that it is not about me and what i do it is about him and what he's done and if i believe what he's done then i have to trust that he is going to make me that he's going to shape and mold me, that he makes a better Jesus than I ever could. Like, I want to try to imitate Christ in everything I do, but in reality, like, I'm better letting Jesus be Jesus through me than I ever am trying to be Jesus for people. And that really is just a reminder of that. Last snapshot, and this is the coolest snapshot, because I want you to know, these are all the events that had happened in Peter's life before in different times. Um, and this is kind of like part of the, this is kind of, I think, the pinnacle, one of the pinnacles of uh, Peter's ministry. Don't, don't get me wrong, he continues to do some more crazy stuff. Uh, but this is one of the moments where you really get to look at it and be like, wow, this is awesome. This is God working through him. Um, and that is in Acts 2, if you turn your Bible to Acts 2, uh, verse 36. If you don't know Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, then Acts is right after um, those are only four books in the Bible I know in a row, so don't ask me any other ones. My wife can name all of them in under like a minute and a half. It's pretty impressive, a minute, something crazy like that. Me, I'm like using the index still. <laughs> it's crazy. All right, Acts 2, verse 36 through 41. So set this up for a second. Peter is preaching this sermon, okay? Peter is preaching this sermon. This is after the Jesus had died and ascended, right, sent the Holy Spirit. This is, this is all, this is post that, right? This is Peter pre Preparing a sermon and speaking to a bunch of people, right? Speaking to a rather large crowd. And um, this is what happens. And I think this is a great reminder of how, like, not only is it about, 
is it not about performance and what I'm capable of doing, but it's about how capable God in me is, how capable Christ in me is, and believing that he is going to see it through every time. Verse 36, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom, you, whom you've crucified. You crucified, sorry. Verse 37, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Verse 38, and Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself and with many other words he bore witness and he continued to exhort them saying save yourself from this crooked generation so those who received his word were baptized and they were added that day about 3,000 souls listen Billy Graham, all these great evangelists we've ever had, like, it, it, have preached some fire, dynamic, amazing messages and seen countless souls come to know Jesus, right? Peter is preaching, and, I, I, like, to thousands upon thousands, who knows, there may have been exactly 3,000 people there, there may have been way more, who knows, but he's preaching to at least 3,000 people. And can I tell you something about Peter between between the time that he was denying Jesus and between the time that he preaches this message. Like, let me share some information about him. Um, he didn't go to seminary. He didn't go to some leadership preaching classes. He didn't develop a great mentor who taught him how to speak very eloquently. Uh, he didn't, these things didn't happen in between. It wasn't like there was some radical change. Because, listen, nothing changed about Peter personally. except for the spirit of the living God that lives in him, who is the agent of change. You see, this Peter that was once denying Jesus is now proclaiming the truth simply because he has the power of Christ that dwells within him, who allows him and equips him to speak the truth. Man, I, I, I don't know about you, and I don't, you know, I feel... Um, I feel extremely inadequate most days, honestly, to speak to teenagers, to speak to C20, to speak to you guys. God has given me awesome opportunities and platforms to speak the truths of him. And every time I walk up to a stage, my mindset is always like this. God, please don't let me mess this up because I'll find a way to do it. And like, I think biggest thing about this is remembering that Peter was not operating off of Peter, Peter's own power and wisdom and his own words. He simply was repeating the words of God. He simply was trusting the spirit of God to work in him and through him. Listen, about 25 minutes ago, I was ready to throw up in the back, all right? Like, like anxious and just like the flesh in me is saying, there's a lot of people out there. This is nerve-wracking. But can I tell you something? I've never felt more confident than I do in this moment. Why? Because of Christ in me, not me. Listen, this is the Holy Spirit. If Etienne was up here talking to you, it'd be a waste of time. Waste of time. Really, I ain't got nothing great to tell you. But I can remind you something that I feel like Peter probably did in that moment as he's preaching the gospel, walking away, he's saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, the Holy Spirit dwelling in me, using me, and making me more like you. Because Etienne's opinions don't always line up with Christ, right? Like, I have my own opinions, right? Like, I think I should be a billionaire. That's a great opinion, okay? <laughs> right? Like, that's, there's a reason why I'm not. But, uh, but I think I should be in the NFL, right? Like, I, I feel these things, but I have to submit to the fact that it is not about my feelings, it is not about my preference, it is not about my own ability. It is all about the ability of the Christ who lives in me. You hear what I'm saying? You want to know what the secret, what the key is, what the self-help is? Let me help you out here. You want to be a better husband? Allow Christ in you to be a better husband. Why? Because he loves your wife far, far more than you do. You want to love your wife better? Allow Christ in you to love your wife. Drop to your knees in the morning and say, Father, you love, insert your wife's name, you love Abigail far more than I ever could. Help me to love her like you do. Because Etienne, I make a sorry husband most days. Without Christ, I'm selfish. 
I want things my way. I want to sit and play video games and eat pizza every night. <laughs> but realizing something, that I have to choose to believe better, not behave better. Some self-help is not going to help me be a better husband. Cool, that's great, and that's awesome. But when Jesus is in the middle of a marriage, when Jesus is in the middle of a family, right, how do I love my kids better? Start by asking God how you love your kids better. What if we start confessing to Jesus and say, hey, I'm going to confess to you that I know that you're the better father, you're the better mother, you're the better brother, you're the better sister, you're the better boss, you're the better employee. How do I be like you? Or even better, how do I let you speak through me? And we start to submit our own desires and passions to Jesus and stop trying to do it all on our own. Because listen, strong arming your way, doing things on your own, building up your own reputation and image, it, it, it's pointless. If people don't see Christ in you, Someone said a great thing. Um, I was looking through Instagram like this past week and uh, someone was talking about like image and how like um, literally like you think about this, like people don't see Jesus. Like Jesus is not just walking around. If you've seen Jesus, that's cool. Tell me what it looks like. But, um, but like never seeing Jesus, like don't audibly hear Jesus' voice, right? But can I tell you how I've been in encounter Jesus? Because somebody loved me like Christ loves me. Because I had an amazing grandmother who looked like Jesus in a way that she loved me and pursued me. And led me to Christ. That's part of the making process. Listen, we're but the vessels. He's the author. He's the one who makes change. He's the one who develops and grows us. He's the one who does that. Why don't we allow him to do it? Because once again, he makes a much better savior than I do. And here's the deal. The promise of Jesus and I will make you is that, that it's just a promise that he's going to see it through. And a lot of you may say, well, you don't know where I've been. i got to work really hard to dig myself out of this hole. Like, I've been really bad. I've been really poor. I've made some bad decisions. I've cheated on things. I've taken things. I've lied. And you just don't understand. You're right. I don't. But he does. And when he died on the cross for you, he forgave you for those things. And he said, you're now a saint. You're now a royal priesthood. You are mine. You are bought at my price. When the Father sees you, he sees my son. He does not see, he does not see your filthy, ugly mess. He sees Jesus in you. So why, why don't we start walking in that knowing and trusting that he is making you you can never measure up that sounds terrible but the good news is you don't have to he already did and if Jesus is enough if Jesus is enough then we simply have to surrender our own thoughts our own minds and our own hearts and our own hands to him and he promises to do the making like, I think about kids playing with Play-Doh um, and uh, making things, you know what I'm saying? Like, and it's always funny because in the preschool, um, in our kids' life, uh, preschool over there, it's all the time you'll see them, like, making things. And, or they'll draw in pictures, and you're like, what is that? They're like, oh, it's a giraffe. And I'm like, totally looks like a ball of Play-Doh. Um, but good job realizing that he is the author of change, and he is molding us and shaping us. There's a couple verses I want to leave you with and encourage you with uh, before we wrap up here. 2 Corinthians 3, 16 through 18 reads as such. Let me get a drink of water. I'm about to. I felt the squeal coming on. <laughs> Start going, ah! Um. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3.16 reads as such. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is... Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being what? Hold on, we're being what? And to the same image from one degree to glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. What do we know? That when we put our trust in Jesus, there is what? Freedom, right? And we believe there's also transformation, right? I love Transformers. I think they're the coolest things ever. was obsessed with the movie Transformers 2. Watched it like 16 times in 16 days. No joke. Um, when I was in high school, thought it was great, thought it was awesome. Enjoyed the movie a lot, right? And the coolest thing about these Transformers is like you see a normal car and then it instantly becomes something much bigger, larger with big guns, which is pretty cool. Um, and you realize that in our own lives, like we're not about transforming ourselves. It's about allowing Jesus to be the transformer in us. 
Not like Bumblebee, but like Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. Let's read these together as well. Hey, if you don't have these scriptures, write these down because these are some good, healthy reminders to yourself um, to know that like it's not you, but it's Christ in you. Um, Therefore, as anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. The old's gone. Like, you need to realize something that that identity where people said, oh, you know Sally, she's blah, blah, blah. You know Jimmy, he's blah, blah, blah. You know, no, no, no. That identity is gone. We don't walk as Etienne the sinner. I don't walk around as, I mean, we talk about this all the time. We joke about it all the time. But like, I'm no longer a sinner saved by amazing grace. Like, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. No, I'm not. That's not who I am. I'm not going to associate myself with that because that's who I was. I'm going to tell you who I am. I'm a child of God who is being made daily to look more and more like Christ. And I'll tell you what, I'm a saint. I absolutely am. Sometimes I don't feel like one. Sometimes I don't even believe it myself. But I have to remind myself that I am a saint saved by amazing grace. Saved by his love. All this is from who? Is it from, it's from Etienne, right? No, it's from you? It's from me? No, it's from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against him. Hold on, wait, what? Not counting their trespasses against him. Don't hold on to yours because they're not counted against you anymore, oh child of faith and child who loves Jesus and pursues Jesus and is a child of God. Remember that. And entrust to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. I love that. I'm an ambassador for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ. He reconciled to, sorry, be reconciled to God for our sake. He made him to be sin who knew no sin so that we may become the righteousness of God. When Jesus paid the price, he stepped in. He stepped in. You no longer have to carry the weight of that. You no longer have to bear the weight of that. It's not yours to carry anymore. Because we no longer walk around as Etienne. I don't walk around as Etienne, the liar, the cheater, the alcoholic. I don't walk around as those. You don't walk around as those. Those aren't labels for us anymore. But our new identity in Christ. Um, People may not see Jesus, but they're going to see me and you. What a great opportunity we have to look and show people the light of Christ. Hey, this is where I want to leave you with this. Philippians 1.6 tells us that he who started a good work in us is committed to seeing it through to completion. Romans 8.1 tells us there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So even when you don't feel, your feelings will catch up. Even when you are hurt and you feel alone, your God will never leave you for us nor forsake you. He loves you. He cares for you. He pursued you. He died for you. Therefore, trust him to make you more like him. And how does that do that? We submit all the things of our lives to him. We submit our thoughts We submit our hearts, we submit our hands, we submit our actions. We serve, why? Because Christ came to serve. We give to those who are in need. Not because they're going to make us get a, we're not going to get a better home in heaven. That's not how that works. We serve and give back because people are most impacted. And people are more likely to come to Christ, not by your words, but by your actions. Yes, share the gospel, preach the gospel, absolutely. But love somebody to Christ especially the people who you really don't want to love, especially the people who really don't deserve to be loved. Because Romans tells us that while we were enemies of Christ, yet he still died for us. Listen, sometimes I'm not even going to give my friends $5 because I don't like them that much. But Jesus was willing to die for his enemies, for those who were enemies of him, that may never choose him, may never turn their hearts to him, yet he still died for them. And so as we, as we send you off here, Next week, we're going to uh, talk about making fishers of men, right? We're going to talk about discipleship. We're really excited about that. Dustin will be back for that. We're really, really excited about that. Um, But I want you to walk away here encouraged, knowing that there is a commitment from the creator of the universe, who is also the creator, but he is the agent of transformation, right? He's the architect of transformation. And it is his job to shape and mold you. Our job is to simply submit and obey and allow him to be Jesus in and through us. And then... We move to the next step where we start to be disciples who make disciples. And really, it doesn't start with behaving better. It starts with believing better. And you may hear that all the time, but I want you to remember that every day, that when you wake up and look at yourself in the mirror and you see something that is not what you think is Jesus, believe the truth. Believe what God's word says. He loves you. He cares for you. Man, Peter had a roller coaster of a life, and I feel that. But I'm encouraged because if Jesus can use Peter to save 3,000, Man, he can use me.
they can use you. There's no age limit. There's no you're too young. I've seen four-year-olds preach the gospel. I'm not kidding you. It's crazy. Go in that preschool right now. Go tell them. Go ask them kids about Jesus. They'll tell you about Jesus. Go in the kids' life elementary. They'll tell you about Jesus. They're learning. Let's pray. Father God, we love you so much. We thank you that you are far more committed to seeing us be more like you than we ever could be. Um, God, thank you for making me this morning, God. Thank you for using um, the power of your word and the truth of the gospel for us to be able to impact you, our, the people in this room, to grow closer to you. Thank you for worship. Thank you for being good. Thank you for being faithful. Even when we don't feel it, we don't see it, we don't know it, God, we can, we can trust that you are. Thank you for never leaving us or forsaking us. In Jesus' name. Amen.